the professor. Okay. Today it's our honor to have uh, Professor Yifeng Liu from UNC Chapel Hill uh, to uh, give the talk about his recent uh, research on learning individualized treatment rules with many treatments. So uh, Professor Yifeng uh, have uh, numerous awards, including NSF um, Korea and uh, the fellow for IMS uh, ASA. So uh, main research for Yifeng is, uh, is in the biomedics and the uh, robust uh, statistical machine learning and, and data science and high dimensional data uh, analysis. So uh, Yifeng now, it's your floor. Thank you, Ying, for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to share some recent work we, we uh, have been doing. So today I will uh, talk about some new method on individualized treatment rules. So that's the scenario when there are many treatments. This is joint work with uh, my current PhD student, Hai Xu Ma, uh, and a colleague, Dong Lin Zeng, at the UNC Chapel Hill. So as an introduction, um, we all know that uh, you know we we need to see doctor when we are sick, and um, the buzzword of personal medicine, and also these days sometimes called known as a precision medicine, is the sense that we not we hope that we get the treatment tailored to each individual characteristics. So rather than just having the treatment for one treatment phase for everybody which in that case, you could have some people effective, some people no effect, but some people not only not, uh, not effective, but also maybe have adverse effects. So then the goal is really to utilize all individual information. For example, the genetic information or clinical information to, to tailor the best treatment for each individual. So imagine that if the population can be grouped into three different groups, and then each group we use different treatments, and then each group may be benefit the most by the corresponding treatment, then overall we have better effects for the treatment. So that's the goal of personal medicine or precision medicine, the transition from one size fits all. So the, the, talk, the topic I'm talking about today is related to individual decision-making. Um, although the example I mostly use is for medical context in terms of the treatment, um, the methodology can be more generally applicable for general decision-making problems. Okay, so for individualized decision-making problems, uh, the general goal is to make precise decision based on individual information um, in the sense that we want to find the best decision which will optimize certain criteria we may set. Uh, as a result, our decision we can make can optimize that corresponding criteria. That's why we often call it optimize, optimal individual decision rule. So one typical example is on the application of precision medicine, although this is not the only area this can be applicable. For example, for individual cancer treatments, we may want tailored therapy based on the patient's genetic information to optimize the health. So the general context is that if one person gets certain disease, there could be multiple treatments available. So these treatments is not really one dominating the rest. It depending on which group of people, one treatment may be better than the other. So then really it's ideal to use individual characteristic to decide what's the best treatment. So that's the problem setting. So in the literature, there are many methods developed to, for this type of problem. Um, typically, we can roughly group the literature into two categories. One is the so-called indirect learning, and then the other is direct learning, I will talk about later. So indirect learning is, can be viewed as two-step procedure. So the first step is to remember our goal is to get a rule, but the, the, this type of procedure is not getting the rule directly, but instead is first to model the treatment effect. 
um, in the sense to estimate the effect related functions under certain model. So then our outcome will be how the treatment effect on the B, we model that outcome according to whatever treatment, for example, genomic information. And then once I model this outcome, then I can try to maximize the outcome according to different rule. Then we get the optimally individualized treatment rule. So there's these two steps to achieve the goal. And there are ma many methods uh, fall into this category. Um, the first step is typically following some sort of regression formulation, for example, Q learning, A learning, and causal forest is like a random forest to model this. All of these are falling into this category. So essentially, it's a model like that's a regression problem. Then you pick which rule gave you the maximum outcome. The other category is the so-called direct learning. This, um, the, the name you can imagine in contrast to indirect, which need to two steps, direct learning will be uh, avoiding estimating the effect function. So it will avoid modeling treatment effect related function, but directly estimating the rule. So this rule um, can maximize the inverse probability weighting version of some sort of the, uh, of the value function. I will define it in a minute. So for now, you can think about these two ways. One is direct estimating this rule without estimating the function. This is called direct learning. The other is estimating the function, then finding which one is largest. Uh, there are many examples in the direct learning category. Uh, often the time, you can change it almost like a classification problem, but it's some sort of weighted version. So like outcome weighted learning and so on fall into this category. Okay, so the motivation for the problem we consider today is that in some applications, the treatment could be many treatment options available. Um, and however, the number of observations for each treatment may be quite limited. But one example we will use later is this PDX study. Uh, this is really for some cancer research data set. Um, we know that the cancer is quite heterogeneous. Uh, study the treatment for cancer can be a very complicated problem. So this PDX study essentially uh, put in tumor into mice and then see how the tumor grow and then use various treatment, the different combination treatment to see which one is more effective. Although, you know, the response for mice may not be exactly the same for human, but it does offer a uh, very useful insight. So for this PDX study, this is a very expensive uh, study because they need to grow a tumor for uh, many uh, mice and then follow up and so on. And uh, uh, they have more than 20 treatments. Some of them are combination treatments. So that if you use several drugs in combination. And th this fall into one of our consideration that the treatment there may be too many. Um, and then often the time for this type of data, you may have quite an balanced structure of the treatment assignments. Um, you know, sometimes you may have one treatment, the percentage of people having that treatment may be dominating, and then some treatment have very small percent of people. So that you have quite unbalanced the problem to deal with, especially if you have many treatment, this problem become more severe. So then the problem is, with very limited observation, with so many treatments, how can we effectively estimate the optimal ITR? That is, I want to build a rule so that I can tell, recommend which rule is the best for future patients. So it can be a challenge. Another motivation is that even though there may be a lot of treatments, uh, often the time, some of the treatments may work quite similarly. This is actually quite true if you use these uh, various combination treatments, um, sometimes these various combination could give very similar effect. So then our idea is that if there's many treatments, each one maybe some of them have very small percentage of uh, people assigned to that treatment. And also many of the treatment can work similarly then can we cluster the treatments so that similar treatment effects can be grouped together. 
so that we can learn it in a higher level in the sense of the group level rather than treatment individual level. So that may can help to learn it more effectively. So they, this is sort of the motivation on our consideration. But whenever you want to cluster things, you may, uh, you may recall that clustering analysis, which is a typical unsupervised learning problem, you want to cluster uh, subjects if they are similar, right, to, to be in the same cluster. But here we are working on uh, like a supervised learning problem because I have outcome for different treatments. I want to cluster them based on the relationship. So it's not unsupervised, right? So it's sort of between the supervised and unsupervised setting. So for the first problem, as I said earlier, because there are many treatments, therefore it can be very uh, not accurate to learn directly or indirectly using the existing method. One of the reasons is because there could be large variability there also could be numerical instability because you, we do not have enough observation for certain treatments. So that's one issue. The other issue is, remember I said we can try to cluster them, but the literature most clustering uh, methods are based on unsupervised learning methods, but here I'm trying to do it in sort of supervised fashion. So that's why we need to develop something different. So this is more, more of the motivation of the problem of our consideration. So we call it a supervised clustering. And the goal is to combine supervised, in this case, trying to estimate the individual treatment rule, as well as unsupervised learning. In this case, we want to cluster treatments together. But I want to combine them uh, as one objective function. And then how do we cluster the, them is based on the re, using the relationship that is the response uh, to the covariate treatment relationship. So here, the time side referring to the interaction term uh, really is how the treatment and covariate interaction going to affect the response. So we want to cluster the re, uh, the treatment based on the relationship. In other words, if this relationship are similar for certain treatments, I hope to group them together. If they are different, I hope to, to put them in different groups. So then I hope the goal is to formulate the supervised clustering problem as a convex minimization problem. So later I will show that we will have a loss term to measure the goodness fit. Uh, and a fusion penalty, try to fuse different treatment together. And that we have a tuning parameter, try to balance them, and then to do it the data adaptive way to fuse treatments together. And because there's a tuning parameters through this regularization framework, we can build an entire solution path of this clustering process. And as a result, we can do similar to the typical clustering analysis, we can uh, visualize using us almost like a dendrogram to see how the treatment can be fused together. So that can give a uh, very interesting interpretation how the treatment work and how they are similar to each other. So that's the uh, sort of the outline what we're gonna talk about the main idea. So not, next, let me start to talk about the, the setup of the problem and then introduce our method. So the data we have is in triplets. So the Z here are the features. You can think about the covariates could be including genomic information of the individual people or clinical uh, measurements. A is the treatment assignment. So you can imagine that there may be M different treatment options available. Uh, you know, using cancer as example, suppose we want to deal with, say, uh, lung cancer patients, and then there may be 20 different treatment options available. Then the goal is that for this individual patient with the given features for this pe person, which treatment is the best for us to use so that the outcome is the best. So here the outcome, why we call the reward just to uh, be consistent with the reinforcement learning literature, 
So the reward here indicating the outcome and uh, uh, without lots of generality, we assume the larger the better. So using the causal inference uh, formulation, we have the potential outcome. So Y of A uh, uh, denoting the outcome if I assign little a as a treatment. But we know that for each person, I can only assign one treatment. So we won't be able to see all different treatments, how the response is going to be for this individual person. So that's why it's also known as a potential outcome. And then the probability of assigning different treatments, a given covariance, is the propensity score. And our goal is to learn this individualized treatment rule, which is mapping from the covariance space to the treatment space. So Z is the covariance, A is the individual treatment. So we want to decide which treatment we're going to assign. So the value function uh, you know, of uh, ITR can be defined really as the expected outcome using a particular rule D. So this uh, value of a uh, rule D is the expected outcome using that particular rule. So the goal is, remember I said the outcome, we assume the larger the better. So the goal is to finding this optimal rule D star to maximize the value function. That is, I want to find according to different, you know, whichever rule function I can use so that the value is maximized. So that best rule, we use D star to denote that. So this is the value function framework based on the expected outcome. Um, that's a, well, it's a popular criterion used in the literature. I, I just want to mention that it may not be the best for all problems because sometimes if you have, uh, if you worry about the tail behavior, or variability, rather than use the mean outcome, we may use some other alternative criterion. Uh, for example, we may worry about the quantile or the a mean below certain quantile like conditional value at risk and so on, all various mean combination. So we have some work along that line as well in terms of the robustness issue. But today uh, we will focus on the mean outcome that is the value function framework. Okay, so here we just uh, uh, assuming the typical causal assumptions and uh, these causal assumption is really just uh, ensuring we have identifiable value function, uh, which is really the, the expected outcome given the, uh, the particular treatment, uh, the, the decision rule we have. And our goal is to learn the best rule in the sense that I want to given the covariance, and I want to find the rule that maximizes the conditional outcome, uh, expected conditional outcome. And this gave us the heterogeneous treatment effects we want to learn so that this maximizes this corresponding uh, expectation. So really, as I want to find this function D to give us the corresponding value is maximized. So that's the goal of the problem we want to solve. In other words, I want to identify this D star as the best mapping. Okay. So to move forward, we need to consider the model setup. So we consider a regression model. Y is the outcome. And then Z, remember, is our covariance. A is a treatment. So then I have in two terms here, one is only have Z, that's the covariate, but no treatment. So this is known as the main effect or treatment-free effect. And then the second term, I have the sum uh, indicator of the treatment assigning for different little a, and then this T is the interaction effect. This interaction effect is related to covariates as well as the specific treatment. So this is the treatment covariate interaction effect plus some error term. And then we have some, uh, some assumption here just ensuring the identifiability for the formulation. So we make sure the interaction term sum to zero, the expectation of the error term condition expecting zero, the variance is bounded. So this is the typical assumption. 
So here, the interaction term, we have the parameter CA. So this is parameter CA uh, characterizes the interaction effect for each treatment A with the covariate. So this is uh, some parameter associated with the interaction effect. So this sum to zero is really just used for identifiability. And because what we want to learn is the best rule, so therefore, I want to maximize this term because I want to maximize the outcome. But since this term have nothing to do with the rule, therefore, the only thing matters is this interaction effect. So we want to find the rule to maximize this T. So in other words, I want to find the, the A. So uh, I've max this T. And then given this uh, if, uh, parameter estimate, I just find the rule to be the maximum gave us the maximum of the interaction effect, okay? So now that's the setup. So the idea is that our hope is to group the treatment effects together if they are similar. Now, similar treatment effects meant to be similar values of the C or the parameters because that's parameter associated with the interaction. So in other words, if I want to group similar treatments, the same thing as finding similar CA, and then it's similar to be fusing the C together into several groups because the different group corresponding to treatment group. So that's the main idea. And because the treatment free effect term does not involve the treatments, so we can subtract that out. So I can work on the residual term. And here, for simplicity, we consider linear, although this formulation can be extended to nonlinear as well. So it's the linear between covariates and the parameter term. So the idea now is that, remember, I want to fuse things together. So because the C corresponding to the parameter for different treatment, so then the idea is, can I fuse different parameters together? So this this is the penalty on the difference. Now, if the difference is zero, that means they are the same. So here, this, this uh, first term is the last term. It characterizes the regression, the goodness of fit. And then um, I have the L1 norm here to characterize the difference of the parameter. So then the P lambda is a penalty function to encourage them to group together and I have a tuning parameter, and this is the empirical version. So the interpretation is I hope to maximize goodness fit, but at the same time, I hope to minimize the heterogeneity among treatments simultaneously using this formulation. Okay, so that's, that's the first idea is to fuse them. Now in practice, you may see this fusion, the computation can be expensive if I have a lot of uh, covariates there. So this computation could be huge. However, we know that in practice, not all parameters, uh, not all covariates going to be related to the interaction term. So we may have certain elements related to the treatments uh, so that can be used X to denote as D-dimensional, and the rest may not be showing up in the interaction, only show up in the main effect. So the P minus D term may not be related to interaction. So therefore, I can divide the covariate Z into two groups, X and the V. The X is related to interaction term. V is not related to interaction term. If that's the case, then I only need to group the beta. I don't need to care about the gamma because that's not related to the interaction term. So in other words, I can try to divide the Z into X and the V, and then I only need to fuse the X part, not the V part. But interesting thing is by removing the main effect term, for anything not related to the interaction, the coefficient can be shown to be zero. So therefore for V, all these coefficients the gamma should be all zero. So therefore, I only need to impose penalty on the X part or the beta. Now, now that looks 
nice because I can simplify the problem into X and V, and the V part, I can set everything to be zero. And now the question is, how do we classify Z into X and V, right? Because often the time, you wouldn't know that ahead of time, that it's not typical to be available. So we need to find the data that way to divide Z into X and V. Then I can just focus on fusing the X part. So next I will talk about how do we actually divide them. So if we rewrite the problem, and again, the formulation, I have the main effect term, remember the Z become X and V, but this main effect term a treatment free effect, so the A is not here. And now this term is the interaction term, the treatment and the covariate interaction term that can be right into two parts, one related to the beta or the X, the covariance X, the other related to the V, the parameter gamma. Remember I said earlier, if the gamma here are not different according to different treatment, then the gamma parameter has to be zero. Therefore, it can be simplified only the x here, x beta here. So that's the formula uh, formulation. So if we can distinguish x from v, so divide the z into x and v, then the objective function can be simplified only learn the beta part by fusing the beta. So if I have p-dimensional problem, I reduce to d of them to be the x, then this problem can be much smaller computation-wise. You know, the only so, difference from the previous lines of computation. Yeah, question? Yes, uh, can I ask like uh, how you order L and T here? So L and T uh, has order, right? Right, so, so mm -hmm. yeah. So if we have, um, suppose I divided the, the X, uh, the, the, the Z into X and V, after I divide that, then I'm fusing different treatments. So for the treatments, we are doing all pairwise treatments and essentially all the different pair, we need to group to see, try to merge them uh, oh. together, right? So in okay. other words, this, this is gonna be like, if I have uh, M different treatments and this is M choose two, that's why there are a lot computation wise, so we try to reduce the dimension here to simplify the computation. Okay. Yeah. But I still haven't talked about how do we divide Z into X and V yet. So, uh, but right now, just assuming if I divide them into X and V, this problem becomes simplified to just focus on the X part. Okay. So now, how do we actually divide the X uh, the Z into X and V. So recall that our parameter, the C, I have C1 to Cm, and uh, this is each one related to a particular treatment. I can rearrange them according to the covariance. So originally C1 to Cm, each one is p-dimensional, okay? Because this is treatment one to treatment M, each one is p-dimensional parameter. I can re it's essentially like a very long parameter is P times M. So I can rearrange them according to covariates, uh, like the, the, the psi here, psi one to psi P, and each one um, is uh, M dimensional because this corresponding to M treatments. So, you know, you can, e it's P times M, you either group by treatment or you either group by covariates. So if I group by covariates, each covariate have m of them. So now the, the idea is that by definition, if it's belong to V, meaning it does not relate to the covariate uh, treatment interaction, then the true parameter associated with those should be zero, okay? Because they are not different. And then because I uh, take, make them add to zero, therefore it has to be zero if there are no difference. So therefore, the true structure gonna be, if I have D variables to be related to interaction, they are there, the rest has to be all zeros, okay? Because if they are not related to interaction, they, ha they have to be all zero because there are no difference. And I removed the, the mean already. So the rest has to be zero. So now you can see, I'm essentially rewriting my parameter into p different groups. 
And then these groups is if they are a bunch of zeros, those groups corresponding to the parameter, uh, the covariance has no interaction, intera uh, treatment covariate interaction. But if it's not zero group, then we leave it there for fusing. So this motivates us to use the group lasso idea to group them according to the treatment group. So if certain group are zeros, that means it belongs to the V. If they are not zero groups, it belongs to the X. Okay. So again, you know, I'm make the P times M parameter into P groups and then try to use group penalty to identify what's X and what's V. Once we remove those zero groups, then I know the rest belong to X, then I can do the fusing of treatment among those. So that's the idea of dividing to the covariance into X and V. Is that clear? The, the idea of how to divide in them? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so this is the group lasso idea is that I'm using group lasso you, in the P groups, try to merge them. If the certain group are zero, then it belongs to V. If they are not zero, it belongs to X. So the advantage by doing this is the later fusing of treatments only need to be applied to the lower dimensional uh, parameter beta rather than the entire thing. So therefore the fusing can be more effective to cluster treatments and as well as the competition wise can be easier as well. You know, imagine if my original dimension is like a thousand by group last, so it end up to be like a hundred or something then competition wise is simplified greatly. All right, so then in terms of implementation, after the group lasso step, then we can apply the fusing step by fusing the treatment together by merging their uh, parameter together. And then in this way, once if for the betas are same, they are becoming the same group of treatments have similar effects. So that's the idea. So essentially, we have two steps. One step is to use group lasso to divide the treatment, uh, divide the covariates into X and V, and then we try to do the fusing of treatment using the covariate X part. And then once we fuse together, we may have the treatment to uh, form together as groups. Okay. So. Um, in terms of the uh, optimization of our problem, we have minimization of a loss term plus penalty term. And then notice that if I'm just using the square loss as well as the L1 penalty for differences, this is really a convex minimization problem. Therefore, is we can ensure a global solution. And uh, you know, convex minimization here is, an, uh, is a very typical one. And I can uh, iterative solve the problem by initialize the beta obtained through the group plus so algorithm. And then I can apply some weighting here just to help the fusing more effectively. Um, this is similar to the um, adaptive like so idea. So if the betas are similar, we using a larger panel, a larger weight here to ensure they are, they are uh, more likely to be same. If they are more different, I'm using a smaller weight here so that I impose smaller bias for the, from the penalty. So once I have that, I can solve this optimization problem. We can use uh, this uh, uh, gradient design algorithm. So there are different versions. We can use the accelerated proximal gradient algorithm to do the optimization problem. And we can repeat that. And, and again, the idea for the weights here is to uh, help us to get more effective grouping. So in other words, we put a larger weights if we expect they are similar and a smaller weight if we expect they are different. Okay. All right, so let me next talk a little bit about some theoretical properties and then I will show you some interesting numerical examples. So theoretically, what are we trying to do? So again, there are M treatments. 
And the, the, the difficulty of learning ARM treatments is ARM is too big. You may have too few people for certain treatments. It can be difficult to do it accurately. So our idea is to try to group them together, um, say into K different groups. Now, theoretically, the ideal case would be the M treatments group into K groups, but each group, the different treatments are identical effects, right? So that's the ideal scenario. But of course, in practice, it's not going to be identical. So they're going to be have some differences and so on. Uh, I will show you the, new, the data example later. But theoretically, assuming that's what we have, we hope our method can do in the right thing, right? So we are assuming the M treatments can be indeed partitioned into K different treatment groups. And within each treatment group, they are identical. And then the beta zero represents the true regression coefficient. And because they are same within each group, therefore the beta is going to be same for the treatment belong to the same group. Okay, so that's the ideal situation. We want to see theoretically whether the method doing the right thing. So our goal is to develop consistency of recovering the true group structure. That is our estimated parameter converge to the truth beta zero as asymptotically as the sample size go to infinity. So we consider two different steps for achieving this goal. The first is showing under the oracle structure, that is I tell you the group's treatment structure, the oracle estimator gonna converge to beta zero. This is intuitively, this must be the case, right? Because if I tell you the group structure, the corresponding estimator has to convert to the truth because it's really just a regression problem. And then the other step is we try to show that what we are doing, identify the uh, Oracle estimator <clears throat> uh, with high probability. In other words, our estimator is equal to the Oracle estimator with a probability converge to one. So, with these two steps showing correctly, and then we essentially can show that our estimator converts to the underlying truth asymptotically. Okay, so that's the uh, the flow of how we're gonna do it. So the theoretical property we want to show is under the true group structure, we can uh, write the alpha zero to be the distinct values for base zero. Remember base zero uh, for treatments within the same group, they should have the same parameter. Therefore, for K different groups, there are only K different parameter alpha. So many beta duplicates because if they belong to the same group, they are the same. Then I can define the so-called Oracle estimator with the given group structure to be alpha zero. That is, I'm trying to get to the alpha estimator using the design matrix related to the true group structure. So that is the case, you know exactly what's going on. And then um, I, I use, we can consider the diverging number of treatments, true group number and the covariate dimension. <clears throat> And the M minimum to be the minimum number of observation receiving treatment from the same treatment group. Uh, and then the, the beta hat oracle is expanded from the alpha hat by writing a lot of same estimator for the treatment belong to the same group. So we first can show that the oracle beta hat converts to the true beta zero asymptotically. So, um, you know, in this case, we can show the beta estimation difference from the truth is same, the alpha hat difference from the truth. And we can find the bound of that, essentially saying that we can achieve the consistency of the Oracle estimator to the truth. So that's the first step. And then the second step is to show our grouping is doing the right thing. That is the, the by doing the fusing penalty, we essentially can identify the grouping. So we are here assuming I'm using the bias the penalty. That is the penalty can help us to merge things, but do not impose a lot of uh, bias for things that are very different. 
Um, so in this case, we can show that um, by assuming the device penalty as well as sufficient signal, then we can show that the our estimator using the fusing penalty equal to the Oracle estimator with high probability. Therefore, by combining the two steps, we can show that our estimator can converge to the true Oracle, uh, the, the underlying true parameter asymptotically. Okay. So again, you know, the theory is under strong assumption. It's just showing under the ideal case, that is, the treatment fall into several groups, and then within the group they are identical. Then our method can do the right thing asymptotically. Okay. All right. So, are there any questions before I move on the numerical studies? Okay. So, for the numerical study, we want to see how the method work. Um. So, we consider uh, ten features here and the treatment can be unbalanced design and the reward fall into this relationship. So these parts are treatment free effect and this is the treatment covert interaction. And then I consider uh, treatment effect have homogeneous grouping structure, meaning within the group they are identical. And then we consider uh, 10, 15, 20 treatment then they then group two, three, and four groups. And then we use scenario one as an example just to illustrate how things are set up. So scenario one have one to five belong to one group, six to eight belong to one group. And this is the interaction term. So we want to essentially the interaction term tells us the optimum IPR is depending on this part. So if it's less than zero, you should uh, recommend group one, greater than equal to zero, recommend group two, okay? So we compare where several different methods. These methods are based on the ITR with the original number treatment to learn directly without grouping. And the comparison of our method with grouping, the criterion we're gonna use is use, uh, we select lambda based on five-fold cross-validation on the estimation of the value. And the evaluation is the, uh, we want to look at the value, the larger, the better, and then the misclassification rate, the smaller, the better. Okay, so this is a box plot showing the different treatments, uh, uh, different message comparison. So here, the red corresponding to random forest, and then this next one is the direct learning methods. And the third one is a uh, penalized least square. Uh, it's an indirect method. The last one is our method. And the first row corresponding value, the larger, the better. The second row corresponding the miscustom rate, the smaller, the better. So you can see uh, the proposed method can do a lot better in terms of both value and the misclassification rate. This is not surprising because the other methods are not utilizing the group structure. It's learning that directly, but we are trying to group them. So therefore it can help the learning more effectively by uh, reducing the variability. And therefore we can get the value and the discussion rate better. You can see the variability is smaller than the other ones. And you know, that's a result of trying to group things together. There may be some outliers that correspond to the scenario that the grouping didn't do it correctly for those particular replications. Therefore, the result for those may be bad. But on average, we can do, uh, you know, can improve the result by grouping them together substantially. Okay. So in terms of recovering the true group structure, so we have three different scenarios. You can see the first scenario is about 95%. The second scenario is you know, about 70. The third scenario may be about 55, depending on sample size. The larger the sample, the, the better for the grouping. And this is also showing you the scenario challenges. And if you remember the different scenario, 
I may have more treatments and more groups, then the num higher number of treatments, higher number of groups, the more difficult the problem gonna be. Therefore, identifying the entire the exact group structure can be more challenging. But nevertheless, by doing this step can really help the learning because by doing the additional learn, uh, grouping step, we can reduce the variability by, by borrowing the strengths of pulling the data together to learn together if they are indeed similar, okay? So that's the, um, the corresponding um, recovering probability of the ratio. Uh, next, let me show the, some dendrogram. So this dendrogram is possible because I'm using this uh, penalized framework as a function of tuning parameter. Now, when I have the tuning parameter equal to zero, that means we didn't fuse anything together. So therefore I have individual treatment there. But as we increase lambda, things to start to merge together. And as I'm moving the lambda get larger and larger, things are merging more and more. So I, you know, eventually when your lambda big enough, every treatment are merged together. So now the goal is to Along the path, we are finding the right, the best grouping. So for the first scenario, if I cut here, we get the first and the second group. Second scenario cut here, I get the three groups. The third scenario had the four group, uh, the uh, five groups. So we can do this correctly um, by finding the suitable lambda through cross validation. So again, as I increase lambda, things to start to uh, merge together. Uh, just as I said earlier, lambda equals zero, you don't have any penalty, therefore no clustering pattern. As I increase, then the fusing start to occur, therefore we encourage similar treatment to merge together. And then once you're large enough, you merge everything together. So then it won't be useful. But the, the, the interesting thing here is that this dendrogram can show you some relative similarity for treatments because uh, you know, by seeing this dendrogram, you can see how this treatment can be relative relationship with other treatments. In practice, besides the effect, there may be some other consideration. For example, you know, if there are two treatments, they are somewhat similar in terms of effect. However, if one treatment is a lot more expensive than the other, or if one treatment the side effect is a lot stronger than the other, then this can be uh, you know, useful information to help us to select treatment as well. Okay, so last, let me show you some uh, the PDX study. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for human cancer, uh, again, it's have very heterogeneity, like a strong heterogeneity among the treatment effects for different patients. Um, you know, we are all different in terms of genomics and there are lots of differences. Therefore, the treatment can be different for different people. Um, for example, it's now known that the breast cancer, certain subtype chemotherapy doesn't really work. Then we know the chemotherapy have very strong side effects. Of course, if you know it ahead of time, you wouldn't recommend chemotherapy for those people. So therefore, you know, understanding the heterogeneous effect, understand what's the best treatment can be really beneficial for treatment as well as uh, for the patient's experience as well because of side effect consideration. Now the PDX study, as I mentioned earlier, is really to study tumor using mice because we cannot duplicate the human we cannot grow tumor on human to study, but we could do it on animals like for mice uh, study. So the PDX is really transfer tumor pieces from patients to mice. And then uh, the, the study try various treatments to see what's the response for different treatments for treating the tumor on the mice. The goal is really personalize optical cancer treatments uh, for five types of cancer among a large number of uh, FDA 
approved the preclinical cancer therapies. So again, you know, in practice, it's not like there are no treatment. It's, there's no one treatment fits, fix everything. So there are a lot of treatment options out there. It's unclear for a given patient what's best to use. So that's the goal of the PTS study. It's really to do to identify the personalized optimum cancer treatment. So here for our purpose uh, to illustrate the method, we using the uh, colorectal cancer and uh, to study the corresponding treatment for this particular cancer. Uh, there are around 847 uh, mice from the different PDX line were treated with 20 uh, treatments. So these 20 treatments, some are single treatments, some are combination treatments. So when I say single treatments, it may be referring to one particular drug. Combination treatment could be a mix of different drugs using together. The Y here is a scale the maximum observed tumor shrinkage from the baseline. Of course, the, the larger shrinkage that's indicating more effective from the treatments because essentially we hope the tumor will be completely gone. So the larger, the better in this case. The features, we have 93 uh, significant genomic biomarkers of patients used here. Okay, so this plot showing uh, before we apply the method, just to have a sense on the 20 treatments, on the effect of the different treatments, so this box plot just showing you the treatment effect in terms of the response. Um, so you can see the this first part are all single treatments. The second part are all combination treatments. So if we just look at this, it's indicating that a combination maybe have potential to be better than single treatment. And if we really look more carefully, that the BYL and the plus B in this combination treatment appear to be better than everything else. If we just look at this uh, simple um, exploratory, exploratory study, look at the, the different treatment effects. So appearing this combination is the best. Now for, a, for our study, we randomly uh, split the data into six folds with five folds to train the remaining to evaluate. And again, because we wouldn't know the response for any after treatment, so we're gonna use those matching with our recommendation. So uh, it's essentially only use the subset matching to, to evaluate. This is common practice for the ITR literature. And that we select human parameters to request the addition as well. Okay, so this is the result by doing the fusing. So you can see, um, again, we have the 20 treatments through this dendrogram type of look by merging things together. And it's quite interesting that um, if I'm selecting the best lambda, it's cutting here, which gave us three different groups. So one group here, one group there, and a singleton group. And interestingly, the most combination treatments includes the BYL as a common one to group together. So you can see the BYL here, BYL here, BYL here, BYL here. Um, it's a lot of them together. And then BYL plus BIN is, remember we showed earlier, itself appear to be the best um, previously by doing this uh, look at the different treatment on its own. This one appeared the best. And it's interesting that by doing this uh, fusion, this one form its own group. And then the other forms uh, two separate groups. So in the end, by um, using our method, it's recommend a singleton group for around 92% of the patients. Uh, the rest are recommend to one of the two groups. And this is also perhaps why we showed earlier this combination treatment appear to form is dominating the rest, uh, appear to work the best. And this analysis showing that this combination treatment appear to be 
one of the best you can use for this set for this particular cancer application. It's not recommended to everybody. It's recommend 92%. Still there, around 8% recommend the others. But it's quite interesting to see this one seem to be so dominating uh, in the end. Now, if we remove the combination treatment, just look at the single uh, treatment ones. And this is the grouping of the 13 single treatments. Um, and it appears to recommend most people to the second one, the 94%. Um, and uh, uh, their, the other one only has a small percent of people being recommended. Uh, interestingly, for the middle one, we have both BYL and BIN to be in this uh, group as well. So that's recommend, you know, indicating those are important treatments. Okay, so just to show you the response in terms of uh, uh, using different methods, what's the result gonna be? So you can see our method, the last one, you, with our treatment or with our combination treatment, both to seem have some advantage. It's not huge, but it appeared to work slightly better than other methods in terms of the uh, response. Okay, so just to conclude, um, today I introduced this problem that the individual treatment rule selection when we are many treatments, and then among the treatment, there may be homogeneous group structure. So then the problem becomes, can I data adaptive way to group the treatment together into uh, different groups, therefore we can learn them better. So we use this method to identify the structure by cluster the treatment together in the data adaptive fashion. So we essentially using things between sulfides and unsulfides. So we call it the sulfides clustering through a convex optimization problem. And because this uh, uh, can be done through a different tuning parameter. Therefore, we can plot a dendrogram to visualize how the treatment can be grouped together. Um, some extensions we can consider is to, right now we only consider the continuous outcome, but in practice there could be discrete outcome, survival outcome, and so on. And right now we only consider single stage problem, but in practice there could be a multi-stage dynamic treatment regimen. So there will be interesting to study how to group treatments uh, along the dynamic treatment regimen as well. And uh, so here today, I'm talking about this regression type of formulation problem. And uh, uh, we also develop another method using uh, classification-based or direct learning-based method as well, um, which, which if you're interested, I can share uh, the paper with you. Uh, that's all I will present today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.